Saya perlu ke mana? Hey everyone. Hi Gary Gibson. Hi Cole. Hi Chris. Hi Dave. Hi Don. Hi Douglas. We're just having a bit of a technical issue at the moment. Unfortunately, Mark is having trouble actually joining as a panelist. Um, so the star of the show, unfortunately, is not here yet. Oh, he's coming in, but it's, for some reason he's got the name he's Keenan Irwin. <laughs> so oh, welcome, Mark. Me. <laughs> <laughs> that's me, actually. But that's okay. We'll, we can share the name for the next hour or something. What's in a name, Keenan? What's in a name? name? Well, normally we just do one Keenan, but we've got two now, so it must be. <laughs> yeah, we, we were just discussing Shame. before we came on air there that uh, why is everyone in the world using Zoom? It seems to be the worst tool of all. For <laughs> it's the most unintuitive thing to set up. It's the hardest thing to to get working. But here we are. Yeah, the answer is Andrew. It's the worst uh, system apart from all the others. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> It's so good to see you, Mark. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, great to see you. And hello, everybody who's on the call. So thank you for having me. So uh, we'll just give everyone a couple of minutes just to, to come in. I think we have about 160, 170 people registered. So we're at 60 at the moment. We'll give everyone a few minutes just to drop in. Yeah, I was going to say, um, normally I'd hate to uh, hold people up on a lovely night like this when they should be outside. But of course, that's no longer true. So. <laughs> where are you mark where are you in the world whereabouts are you just at home in glasgow today andrew okay where the sun is uncharacteristically shining so yeah no it's mm -hmm. same here it's looking nice and rachel mm -hmm. brought a curtain with her this listen i have upped the backdrop game the amount of calls that everybody else is like, huh, wait a minute. I need to think differently about what's going on behind me here. I'm on brand as well, mister, just like you. <laughs> Are they all asking where you can download that wallpaper for that? And then they realise <laughs> it's actually a curtain in your house. <laughs> it's like the big reveal when I come in. I should have made an entrance. <laughs> <laughs> you always make an entrance, Rachel. <laughs> Cool. So I think maybe we get started. Uh, Rach, if you want to kick us off. Brilliant. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Rachel Brown, and thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Tuesday night. If you're in anywhere in the central belt, you'll be enjoying some sunshine. Um, if you're not, I hope it's not too bad where you are. So I'm Rachel, and I'm part of Creative Entrepreneurs Club, and I'm just going to talk very quickly about the series that we're going to do around our webinars on a Tuesday. Um, introduce you to Mark Logan and to Andrew Dobie, and kind of, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see all of our banter, just so that everybody's clear. If you've never done this before, you only see the person who's speaking at the time. Um, but there are going to be three of us on the call. So why are we here? What are we doing? Um, the Creative Entrepreneurs Club, we kicked this off last year. We used to be um, well known as Cultural Enterprise Office. So when I inherited that organisation, um, I decided it was time for a change and we really needed a big change. Um, little did we know, though, at the time, the change was going to be as monumental as we're in now. Um, the Creative Entrepreneurs Club is, is a member driven network and we wanted to set this up so that the, the tribe of us that are creative entrepreneurs and creatives um, could come together, share stories, learn things, support each other and really thrive in our business. It was really clear though, beginning of March, that the world was going to be changed forever and um, I was getting a little frustrated, if I'm honest, around the comments about let's have some let's have some skin in the game we're all in this together and the reason i was frustrated with it i just didn't see the action i didn't see everybody coming together in the way that could so um i was delighted although slightly worried at the same time and andrew set up the covid19 creative industries support group on linkedin um worried because uh, it was really necessary but delighted because i thought at last the there's people that we can join forces with. Within 24 hours, um, Andrew had over 1,600 people in the group. Um, and it was clear there was a real support needed. So I'm delighted that 
Andrew, for those of you who know him, is founder of Made Brave, is a good friend of mine. Um, we had a good chat, got together, and um, we decided that the Creative Entrepreneurs Club could be a vehicle to support some of that change that Andrew wanted to see in the industry, and also that we wanted to see in and around the work that we do. So everything, if you've not seen it, check it out. Everything we've got is available, it's free. Um, creativeentrepreneursclub.co.uk, please sign up. We had just 300 members in March. Um, in the, today, we have 720 members and it's growing. We have jobs, we have opportunities, we have support. Um, there are specific groups around funding, specific groups around support around for finance, legal, VAT, all of the things that just help cut through the noise a little bit. Um, as part of that, though, we didn't want to be too serious and we didn't have to, just wanted to join in um, with everything else that's going on. So every Tuesday at five o'clock, we're going to have a series of webinars with some brilliant people. And I'm delighted that our first webinar is with Mark Hogan. But before I do, I want to kick off with introducing Andrew properly so you get to see his beautiful face. Just to bear in mind, I don't think his backdrop game is as good as mine. <laughs> but we'll wait and see. Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Rachel. And hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, so as Rachel said, I'm Andrew Dobby. I'm the founder of a creative brand agency in Glasgow called Made Brave. Uh, I also run a content agency over in Edinburgh called Campfire. So um, thanks for joining us in the first of what will be the series of webinars. Um, it's been a strange old, uh, old few weeks, um, I'm sure. Uh, actually, to me, I kinda, I've been saying to people, it kind of feels like one long day. Um, I'm looking at people that you know, are sitting at home, and uh, I, um, I, you know, obviously I'm at home as well, but you know, I, I feel like at this moment, I've never worked so hard as I have over the last few weeks. Uh, I was saying to Rachel as well the other day that I think I actually blacked out completely for that first week. Um, and uh, you know, I've now got people saying it was good to talk to you the other day, and I'm like, did I? did I speak to you or did, you know, and I'm sure you're all in that kind of, you know, when you're kind of going into fight or flight mode, your, your, your body's almost completing tasks for you that you don't know you're doing. Um, and, and I think that's totally normal. And I want to kind of raise that just at the beginning here. Um, a lot of you just now will have be, will be in the worry stage, will be in the panic stage will be in the grief stage as well for kind of businesses um, and you know I almost kind of grieved my, my business as I start to see loads of projects cancelled or slowed down. Um, however, I think, you know, um, you know, when we, when we face um, challenges like this, that there, there's also the stage where there's sort of realization and you have to kick into action and sort of be a little bit more agile and adapt. And I think what I'm starting to notice as well as, you know, I'm seeing some of the patterns in my business is that I'm noticing that a lot of businesses did the panic and now they're readjusting to this new normal and things, you know, people are starting to realize, oh wait, we, need, we just need to con figure out how to, to keep doing business um, like this at the moment. Um, so, you know, so if you're in that stage of panic and worry you know please remember everyone's going through that and if you get to a stage and you're, you're you, you need to talk to people reach out you know um, if you want to reach out to me reach out to me and talk and if I can help you I will if I can't I'll point you in a direction and that was I suppose one of the big drivers for why we cre created this group was I saw that that you know we, we kind of need focus we need leadership just now and um, so we created this creative industry COVID support group if you search for that on LinkedIn and um, we've now had over 3,000 people join that group um, and that started on off as a place to share um, resources, share just, um, you know, build a community and help each other. And it's been great. And, and Rachel and, and, and me got talking and obviously Rachel and CEC, Creative Entrepreneurs Club, kindly gifted their platform. And we've been working to bespoke it to, to, to drive and, and give as much value to you guys as we can. So as Rachel said, there's a job board on there. There's one-to-one -one support where loads of people, um, you can just reach out and um, you can book some time with people. Um, yeah, everyone's given up their time at different points. So, um, yeah, no, I'm delighted today. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Mark and all he's achieved. He's a, a really fantastic leader and I'm sure I've heard him speak a, a number of times and always come away very, very inspired about what he has spoken about. Um, he's also got lots of very practical knowledge from all the businesses that he has grown and run as well. So, um, yeah, hopefully you get some value out of this today. We're running a Q&A as well um, in this session. So Mark's going to, have, we're going to have some questions from Mark and we're going to guide through those. And at the end of the session, we're going to have a QA. and a So if you look down uh, here somewhere, there is a Q&A button. So as we're going along, if you have any questions, 
drop them in the Q&A. And Keenan here, who is our brand manager at Made Brave, he's very kindly going to facilitate and Keenan will pull out questions as we go along. And you also have the opportunity to upvote those. So if you want to pick questions that you think um, are, are the best questions, move them to the top and we'll try and get through those. Um, so I'll pass you back to Rachel. Thanks. So for those of you who have just joining us, we're doing a quick interview with Mark Logan and we're going to be focusing in on resilience during tough times. So as Andrew said, there will be Q&A. Have a look down there. Please post the questions. If there's something burning that you want to ask um, and you don't want to put it in on all group, you can also manage Keenan privately. God love them. Um, when it says all panellists, if you click on that down below, you can also say ma message privately and that will go straight to Keenan or any one of us. So feel free to do that. So Mark is a startup and scale up advisor, investor and professor at the University of Glasgow. Most of us will know him as the former C Q COO at Skyscanner, which clearly is one of Europe's most successful technology companies. In 2014, the Institute of Directors named Mark Director of the Year, and in 2016, he won the UK Digital Masters Award for Excellence in General Management. And in 2017, particularly proud that Mark was announced as Women Enterprise Scotland's first male ambassador. Since leaving Skyscanner, Mark's focus has been on helping to stimulate Scotland's flourishing tech industry, acting as advisor, investor and non-executive director in startups across the whole sector. And he also did a recent TED talk, which I can thoroughly recommend on why women can't lead. Go check it out on YouTube. And we'll definitely add the link in here, um, as you can see. So, Mark, thank you so much for being here. Andrew's going to kick us off with the first question. Great. Uh, so, hi, Mark. And I just want to reiterate that, that comment about the, the TED Talk. If you haven't checked that out, go and check it out. Keenan will pop that in below down uh, at the moment, I'm sure. Um, so, Mark, uh, obviously, you know, um, Rachel described you there, but I think it's always interesting to, to, to get an understanding in your own words of, you know, how you describe yourself these days and what your kind of day-to-day -day looks like. Sure. And, and I might just correct one thing you said, Rachel. Oh, sorry. The, the talk's not called Why Women Can't oh. Wait. Called why can't women lead? Subtle but important difference. You're very true. It's very true. <laughs> um, so yes. Yeah, so, so well, thank you both for your very kind introductions, and hello to everybody, and thanks for attending the, the session. So, I mean, just very briefly, what am I doing now? Well, you know, I spent, um, as I'm sure many people have, I spent in my case over 25 years working in the Scottish business community, predominantly in tech rather than in the the sort of creative uh, sphere, but um, uh, you know, all through that time, I, I was told by many people, some of them in Scotland, some of them outside, that it wasn't really possible to grow a very impactful company or tech company in, in Scotland. It was the wrong location, not enough access to talent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, you know, I, I've very much enjoyed being part of teams that together have proven that wrong from from time to time. So. After, having, after Skyscanner, I wanted to continue to contribute to the companies that are coming through now that are trying to do the same thing and, and really build a critical mass ecosystem here that we can really be proud of. So from that point of perspective, that's guided me to, you know, to, to get involved with companies in different ways, as, as Andrew and Rachel, you both sort of summarised there. And um, more recently, I'm devoting quite a lot of my time now to teaching students at uh, Glasgow University in how to build a tech startup and, and grow a market, et cetera, because you know, they, they are our entrepreneurs of the future. Um, and many of them become disillusioned with the, their early 40s into that space because they haven't really got the, the skills to augment their, their kind of core knowledge and they get disillusioned and go and join big, big companies and that's the end of that. So um, working with Glasgow, I wanted to, to create a course that maybe keeps more of those people interested in the, in being founders or joining startups and, and just filling that end of the funnel, if you like. So that's that's what's occupying me these days. Great. And, and I, I suppose, Mark, just now, you know, um, if you were a startup, if you're raising cash or you've just raised cash or you're trying to start a business or maybe you're, a, you know, a freelancer that's just left a job and just about to start on your own, um, obviously... That, that, that doing that anyway is quite can, can be quite a challenging thing and you know um and in, in, in sort of 
is there advice that you've started to give or are you still figuring that out as well? Well, I mean, I think I'd probably give advice in, in sort of two areas, Andrew. I mean, some obvious advice, which I'm sure I don't have to tell anyone on this call, but from a, from a kind of company perspective, first of all, if you have a company running just now, it really is all about runway lengthening. So it's about hibernation where you can hibernate. It's about cutting costs where you can cut them. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the key thing. And businesses that, that do that early uh, tend to survive these periods. And we've had other periods, not quite like this, but similarly uh, shocking to everybody. And, and, and companies that we respond to those tend to come through more successfully. But I think the more useful advice is more at the, the personal level, because I think you touched on it at the start of the discussion that people are in a state, various states of despair and panic and, and under, very understandably or, or just great uncertainty. And, and you know, I've had many of those types of periods in my life and my more working career. And I think the most important thing I, I've learned from that is that it's really important to install in your mind the right mental models for this situation. Because if you don't, then default mental models play. And the default mental model is driven by everything that's hitting you subconsciously on social media, on um, you know, on the news, and your, your sort of app of choice for the news web feed where things keep updating and it's all very bad. So the default narrative that gets established is that you know, we're all doomed. Um, no business will survive, you know, it's the end of the good times and all that sort of stuff. So you've got to have your own mental models and, and you know, it doesn't really matter what ones you pick. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples I find quite useful, but um, it's really important to think about what those are and switch those in when you find yourself operating other more negative views. For example, one I've always found useful is in any difficult situation is just to look ahead and say in five years time, when I look back on now, will I be proud of how I've acted, of what I did? Did I despair? Did I become you know, angry, difficult to live with? Did I stop trying to find solutions to problems? Or did I do something that makes me proud that I can talk about now? It seems like a simple thing, but it's a useful trick because when we start to, to race and our thoughts start to race, just remind yourself that you want to be able to look back and say, that's someone who impresses me. We are two people, we're our future selves and ourselves, and you always want your future self to look back positively on you. Now, not every day is that possible. So um, the thing is, every day starts afresh with a new sunrise. So you can, if, you, if you fall off that wagon, you can, you can get back on it the, the next day. I think the other thing that's helpful is, you know, we, we, as human beings, we are goal, goal-setting creatures. You know, we, we, we are most motivated not by pleasure or, or by money or, or power or these kind of things. You know, there's, a, there's a bit of motivation to different extents for different people in those. But what we're most motivated by is the search for meaning. And you know, everything we do is about establishing a meaning to the future. Now, if your future's plans and meaning has just been you know, ripped up and thrown in the ground, as, it, as for pretty much all of us to different extents that has been, then that can be very disorientating. That can take away a lot of your positive energy towards your business, towards your colleagues and people you're leading, etc. So I've found in those circumstances, if I'm finding it difficult to establish that future meaning, say six months out, although I should certainly try, but if I can't make it stick, then I just, I just use kind of telescopic goal setting. I just bring in the period I'm looking ahead to be a quarter or a month, or sometimes when it's really difficult, a day, can I get through this day and do some useful stuff? And if you can string enough of those days together, then you'll, you'll get somewhere. So th those, those things are, are useful. And you know, the final example I'll give, which I found helpful, is you know, there's a, I think we're all aware of the, the Chernobyl disaster that happened in, uh, you know, a number of years ago now. And um, there's, there's a famous moment which was recreated very well in a recent serious called Chernobyl uh, on, on the accident. And it's a scene where the, uh, the, the scientists and the, the, the crisis coordinator, they realise that if they don't send some men into the reactor to drain some water tanks in the next 48 hours, 50 million people will certainly die. And it really happens. So it's quite a, you know, a, a galling moment. 
But those, those men they send in will almost certainly die by going into the reactor area. So they assemble the workers at the plant and the scientist explains what's needed. And um, the, the leader of the, the, the men says, well, you know, we're, we're almost certainly going to die because why, you know, why would we do that? And the crisis mm -hmm. coordinator steps forward and says, you'll do that because it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, millions will die. Now, we find ourselves in a different set of circumstances. But I find that phrase, I always find that phrase very powerful. You know, when you start to catastrophize and you start to wonder how are we going to get through, how are we going to, you know, solve these problems, how are we going to work through all the, the issues we have in front of us, the answer is you'll do it because it needs to be done. And it's quite a helpful clarifying phrase. There is no choice. We've got to get through this. So those are some of the mental models I find I have found useful. Um, the trick is to pick the ones that work for you, of course. But my summary is have a mental model that displaces the negative one of we're all doomed. What's the point? Mm -hmm. Can I ask Mark a bit about how you, when we're faced with situations like this, um, the leader should always put the oxygen mask on first and you look after yourself to, to be able to take that forward. But at the same time, you're vulnerable, you have to be transparent, you, you feel the pressure acutely because you, you need to do what has to be done. How do you articulate or have conversations with teams around that? How do you motivate and manage and engage and be genuine with teams when you're in that space? Well, you know, it's a great point you, you make, Rachel, that you know, that people often say to me, what's the most important thing about leadership? And, you know, not that I have all the answers, but, but what I believe is, is that the most important aspect of leadership is self-sustainability. And what I mean by that is, you know, many of us, we find ourselves in stressful jobs. We've been promoted or we're running a business we never thought we'd be running, or it's got, you know, an awful lot larger than it, than it used to be. And uh, it starts to wear us down. We get tired, so we add more hours, or we stress more at night, or we don't sleep. And then we start to lose our ability to be that leader. And uh, you know, if, if you're at a certain point in your life, you've got an awful lot of energy, you can do that for a while, but it doesn't, it doesn't last. So you've, you know, the most important thing about leadership, first of all, is to make sure that you're self-sustainable. You know, what you're doing isn't draining your energy down to zero over some obvious period of time. So I, I think that's, that's extremely important. Then I think the, the second answer part of your question is, is first of all, you never assume that your team isn't as smart as you. So you've got to be honest with people. You know, I think people appreciate that and they don't appreciate a lack of honesty. You know, whenever you think your government's lying to you, think about how you feel about that. It's the same with people in your team. So I think being very honest with people about the situation, but also not falling into catastrophization. Um, you know, don't catastrophize is important. So, you know, in, in chess, the, the, the top players know that every position has resources. You know, if you're in a position that looks lost, there's always hidden resources in that position. And the, and the best players put in the mental energy to find those resources. And the best teams do the same in business. Mm -hmm. So whatever your situation is, you've got to look for those hidden resources that will get you through this. You've got to be thinking about what does how will the recovery work when it comes? What will be different? Is there work we could be doing just now that we've never done because we were too busy operating and now's a chance to do that work so we can come out of this faster? You know, automate something that should be automated, fix your billing processes or whatever it might be. And, you know, your job as a leader is to, is to inculcate in the people you're leading the same sense of agency to do that. And together, if everybody feels that, you know, you, 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 you'll probably succeed and you'll probably get through these periods. Um, you know, remember, there's always more of everybody else than there is of you, by definition, in a leadership position. So if you can sort yourself out and then, and then authentically convey those mechanisms of thinking about the problem to other people, then you've suddenly got 12 or 15 or 100 times as many people mm -hmm. aligned to the same problem, and you're, you'll certainly find a way through. So in summary of that is... Make sure you're self-sustaining. If you're not, fix that first. And secondly, be honest with people, but don't catastrophize. And thirdly, start talking about the future. 
you know, again, in the context of a real, real situation, but start talking about it and, and you'll get people working to do that. Remember, you know, leadership is on, only exists in difficult times. In good times, you're not a leader, you're an administrator because, you know, there's nothing really needing done. Leadership is when things are difficult and leadership is not about who you are in the hierarchy or the, no. what your title is. Leadership comes from everywhere. I think we're seeing that in our society right now. Um, if we hadn't seen it before, we're most certainly <coughs> seeing it now in terms of who we're relying on. So leadership comes from the front line in a war and we're in a war. I don't like war analogies, but let's use it here. It's the front line of your business where leadership comes from. So encourage your people to own this problem the way you do. Create the forums where they can discuss it as peers with you. And the very act of doing that will be good for everyone's mental health and will create a lot of positive ideas for how to get through this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the same whether you, whether you are in a business or an organisation or whether you work on your own as a freelancer or a portfolio career. I think one of the things that has been very clear about the creative space over the last few weeks is that ability to come together um, and work together as one tribe if you like, and, and be able to support each other. So everything that you say is transferable, is, as you quite rightly say, it's not about the hierarchy of an organisation, it's about how we can perform and how we can function together as a community and as a collective group of people. Yes, I, I agree. We, we live in a lot of circles and we should certainly not limit that circle to the notion of business company. I mean, a great and obvious example is this call, you know, um, you, know, you, you good folks have shown leadership by setting it up. Um, but there's many, many examples of that. But that's leadership, you know. It's also supporting each other, even if we're sometimes in competition. It's, 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 it's leadership, and leadership will come from anywhere. Basically, leadership comes from anywhere someone decides to start leading. And to me, leadership in moments like this is, is when, you know, how do people get into leadership positions? They step forward towards a problem when the other people step back from it. Mm -hmm. And, that, you know, if you do that regularly in life, you'll end up in a formal leadership position, but it starts with just stepping forward towards problems from other people are stepping back from them. And we're all in different positions. There's different things we're able to do to affect the situation. But if you start from that mindset, I'm going to step towards this problem, uh, whether or not other people are stepping towards it, that's probably the best career advice, advice I could give anybody, regardless of the current situation, if they want to move into leadership over time. Mm -hmm. So, so I suppose, Mark, just now when you know when we're in a, a situation like this and and that leadership position, um, you know, communication is very important, and I agree with you in transparency. And you know, with my team, um, you know, we we've had daily catch ups every day at half past ten. And uh, some days I go on and I'm thinking, what am I going to say today? Because it's you know, usually you've got to kind of stand up once or twice a month, and I'm and I'm but I'm 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 kind of almost um, making sure that that happens every single day at the moment at half past 10. And, um, you know, we found a lot of kind of innovation for those sessions on how they're used and we're starting to find different ways and means of that. Um, obviously, you know, having run a, a very large business and then having worked with smaller startups and having worked with, with groups that, again, try to communicate, do you think there's a, you know, there's a way to over-communicate or under-communicate at the moment? What, do, what would be your advice as, as the best um, way forward? That's a great question, Andrew. So, so my answer to that is that communication is, should be inversely proportional to the size of the problem. So when everything's going really well, there's less need to run communication ceremonies and forums. I mean, obviously, there's a minimum level you always want to have. That's good leadership and you want to bring new things into the business, new goals, etc. But you often see leaders in particular, especially in larger businesses, which doesn't apply so much here, but <clears throat> it's worth considering that the first instinct when things are going badly is to communicate less. Why is that? Because they're feeling uncertain. They're not sure. They feel they should have the answers. They ain't got them. So they're not going to speak until they've got the answers. Or they're afraid of the reaction they'll get when they don't have all those answers. But actually, the opposite is required. The more difficult a business situation or any situation, the more you should communicate or, or use communication forums of all different types, mm -hmm. um, even if you haven't got a whole bunch of directives to give, because communication does two things. One is it conveys information. The other is, is it reinforces a sense of togetherness. And in a crisis, we especially need that. 
And I suspect, although people will probably not say this to your face, you know, people don't say everything to your face, but people take comfort from that regular call you're having, for example, mm -hmm. even if an awful lot of new stuff hasn't come up. Now, um, in the current situation, we're in one of these very rare situations where a, this is, we're living in the right-hand side of an exponential moment. You know, exponential situations don't change very quickly at first, and then suddenly as that doubling keeps happening, they change so, so, so fast that every day you can't believe it's only been a day, you know. So I think in the period of that, even just a chance to decompress, to exchange thoughts and views is useful. I think the style of communication is important, though. I mean, we often feel as leaders, you've probably seen the, the, the cliched, you know, ask me anything sessions or, you know, those kind of town halls where the, the boss gets up and, and he or she, you know, tells everyone what they think about stuff and people can ask them questions. That's often, to my mind, the wrong way around. We should think of those more as tell me anything sessions. And because usually the people in your business know a lot more than you do about certain aspects of that business because they're on the front line where product ain't selling anymore or sales are harder or customer sentiments changing. So tell me anything is a good idea. Now that works fortuitously and opportunistically for you as a leader. When things are such that you don't have the answers, then having a, a forum where people do more of the talking than you do kills two birds with one stone. One is you learn a lot, you don't have to communicate an awful lot in response at that stage where you figure out your plans, but you're getting that benefit of togetherness that humans need. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a great practical tool that we use in our business for that that might be helpful to others it's called office vibe and basically um, every week it sends out kind of random um, surveys to your team and then they get to feedback all sorts of information that you would never have have heard of before and wouldn't have understood um, and it really helps you you know as you say you understanding what's happening um, in, in your team rather than the other way around so um, so Rach, um, mm. you want to jump in on a question here? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was just making loads of notes. Um, clearly, my own situation uh, needs to make loads of notes. One of the things, um, Andrew, um, sorry, Mark, that I was going to ask you as you were talking was, there's a, there's how we get through this operationally and how we get through this mentally and emotionally are two very different things. And how do you make the balance? How do you get that right? So operations are what keeps us going, but it's the mindset that's going to get us through it, if that makes sense. And, you know, Andrew and I have been saying this a lot the last couple of weeks, that this last week is the longest year of our lives. And it just kind of feels like it continues to grow. How do you get that balance? There's a question coming out. How do you get that balance between operational need of actually having to keep the lights on and do the things that need to be done, as well as the, the emotional and the mental capacity that's needed to do it? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Rachel. So my view on this is that um, you, this is all built off the grief cycle. And mm -hmm. the important thing about a grief cycle is certain stages of the grief cycle have to end. You know, so, like, 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 you know, I, I remember um, situations where in the past, you know, when the inter internet bubble burst, for example, in 2000, that was my first, as a relatively young executive in a startup in those days, that was my first experience of, uh, you know, st stuff suddenly happens uh, that you, it wasn't in the plan, you know, big stuff. And I remember I was in a company called Atlantic at the time, and we had about 150 people in the company, and it, it, suddenly we had to make 50 redundancies, and it was extremely difficult to do. We never thought we'd ever have to do that, and, and it was just very difficult for everybody, not least the people affected. By it, so when when redundancies happen, you know it's, it may, it's maybe surprising the first time to realise that that two groups are particularly upset: the people who've lost oh. their jobs and the people who didn't, because they're going through grief, guilt, you know, anger, all those emotions. And the very very worst thing you can do in that scenario, for example, is to is to try and stand up as a leader and say. It's really sad what we had to do yesterday, but I'm very confident that we've got great plans and I'm going to roll out the strategy we begin tomorrow. You know, any more than standing up at a funeral and saying, you know, I'm very sorry your loved one just died, but look at all the great things we're going to do next year on holiday. Let's start planning the holiday tomorrow. It, you, people go through a grief cycle. Now, we're all going through a grief cycle at the moment, and the grief cycle is the grief for our former belief in how the world was going to work next year. 
and we're disorientated and all that sort of stuff. But the important point is that you cannot overindulge that for too long. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, we, all of us, we have to then say now it's time to move to the next stage, which is acceptance, which I think we're all starting to do. This is the world we're in. Yeah. And then the next stage of, of, of recovery of what, so what are we going to do? So I think when you're you know, discussing this with, with other people, for example, in your own team or other people you work with, I think we have to allow space for people to process a situation and recognize that the situation is not over because every few days new stuff comes along that we have to process, you know, like prime ministers and in intensive care. What does that mean? You know, even whatever your views on Boris Johnson are, the institution of office of prime minister being incapacitated at this is disorientating for people. It's a new thing. You know, there'll be many more of those to come. Um, if intensive care beds became unavailable, we'd feel a, a sudden renewed sense of fear. What if I get ill? You know, it's very, very difficult things ahead of us. So we've got to allow people time and ourselves to process those new realities and to grieve for another thing that we've lost in the interim. But then having left enough time, we've got to get back to to life. So how are we going to keep the business running? How are we going to service those customers we still have? How are we going to find others? How are we going to lengthen our runway? So I think as a leader, your job is to manage that process, is to give the space, but not to overly indulge mm -hmm. that because because negativity is is also a virus. You know, we, it can circulate and grow and spread. So we have to use our judgment as to when it's time to intervene and move us to the next stage in the cycle. Mm -hmm. And I think that from that model will come the sense of when it's right to process and when it's right to operate. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested. Oh, does that, my sound sound really weird for everyone else? Mm -hmm. or is that, um, I suppose, you know, for people who, you know, kind of were starting things right now or kind of in very early stages of the business, you know, some businesses have larger cash reserves and they can maybe ride through this. Some businesses are able to be more agile. I suppose if you were kind of more hand to mouth, um, you know, what, what, what kind of things would you be looking at just now or would you be thinking about for, you know, to survive through this time or, you know, you know, like often and, and you know, often through challenging times you know creative or innovative startups appear and things now you know people might still be in the fight or flight or the survival mode at the moment but i suppose um you know if if you if you were in that stage of business i can imagine that being very frightening just if you know if, if you thought as you say the world was going to look one way and it now looks the other um I, have you any sort of practical tips of how people can adapt or how they can kind of not, not take advantage but just um play to their strengths at the moment yeah, I mean, I, th I think you can think of this as a kind of layer, layered cake, if, if, if you would like, Andrew. At layer zero, we've got to have enough resources to feed ourselves and our families. Now, that, I start there because clearly um, any other considerations above that, if you're not able to do that right now, nothing else is of, is of interest, nor, nor should it be. Yeah. And I suspect we've all, and I'll include myself in this, had those moments in my life, my career, where... Um, you know, I, I was down to the wire on resources, you know, to continue uh, mm -hmm. doing, to looking after my family. So that takes precedence and whatever you can do to, to solve that is the thing that's going to be most in your mind. Assuming that that's under control, let, let's address the, the, the question. Um, and, and, you know, it's, 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 the next layer in that cake is, is can you just keep your business going? And, you know, there's different ways you can hibernate a business. I mean, for example, one business I'm working with, they've cut the, their Windows Azure hosting costs to zero by essentially shutting down their website and putting up a holding page saying we'll be back in September, you know. Um, so th there's always creative ways you can, you can extend that runway. There's always ways you can, uh, you, can, you can make it last longer. If you're thinking of starting a business just now, or you were thinking of starting one, then you know, one, one point I'd make is that a business that has almost no employees has the lowest costs. So one way of looking at this is you, you, you just use this time to further develop your idea and then you come out fighting when, when there's a market. You know, let's not ignore the elephant in the room that for many of us, there's no market just now. So sure. there's a few limited thing you can do. But, you know, it is interesting. I'm sure you've heard the, the kind of uh, cliche that's been going around that, you know, King Lear was written by Shakespeare during the 
the bubonic plague uh, pandemic when he was isolating and um, Isaac Newton uh, essentially postulated calculus during the same period. Now, what relevance does that have to us? I think there's a lot of value in contiguous hours of thinking time. Now, mm -hmm. I'm sure all of us are aware of the feeling when you know, we're too busy operating our business to get time to create or to think or to solve or to you know, fix that issue with my billing system that I've never got around to addressing and all those, you know, those, kind, of, those kind of things. So the one gift that, or silver lining I think this situation has given us is more contiguous hours and I think you, if you use those uh, constructively, you'll probably develop better ideas for that business you were thinking of starting. And you can use that time to reflect on how will the world be different when we come back? What new opportunities will exist in it? I suspect so many very successful businesses are started during very difficult times mm -hmm. because of exactly that factor. The founders were forced to have time to think things through better. Mm -hmm and uh, we're forced to consider opportunities anew, look at the world new, you know, get out of that fixed thinking and start to say, well, how will the, world, will the world work after this? And practicing that breaking fixed thinking will give you other insights that were already probably in front of you if you'd only looked for them before. So, so my, my summary of that is assuming that you know, your level zero needs are more or less addressed and assuming that the question is about you know, if I'm starting, I've got an idea that's been upended, then my answer to it is you've also been given more contiguous hours. You've been given a changing world. And as Jack Ma, uh, a, a Alibaba founder, is famously said, you know, problems are good because they create opportunities for businesses to solve them. And, to, you know, while that might not fit right now in our heads, it will emerge that way. You're, mm -hmm. We're not going to emerge to the old normal. We're going to emerge to a new normal. And there'll be things that you can you can do to to help that new normal work. Um, so I so that's that's how I would I would think about it. But the most valuable of all those points for me is don't underestimate the enormous power of contiguous hours to think about stuff that you don't normally get. Hmm. Now, now you spoke about um, hibernating businesses there, and I suppose there's kind of two ways of looking at that, isn't there? And, and there's obviously different types of businesses. So for some businesses, they just cannot perform anything, you know, like a bar or a restaurant, they have to shut down unless they can innovate in some way and do home delivery and such like. And so it makes sense to cut costs, remove websites, you know, while they can. For other businesses, like service-based businesses, like my own, like, you know, many of the people out here, um, many people that maybe are just freelance as well, um, I suppose... Um, my, I've been sort of talking to people and maybe the advice for these types of businesses is not to go quiet because obviously if you go quiet, people don't know you're there. They can't then buy from you. Would you agree with that? Or Rachel, do you have anything else as well? Do you know you want to jump in on that with as well? Sure. I think one of the, um, I'm really interested, Mark, you're a brilliant storyteller. And one of the things that, um, picking up on Andrew's point around not being able to go dark in this environment there's a storytelling opportunity here. So the other part of that question is what stories would you tell if you were one of those freelancers or portfolio careers or somebody that had to continue to keep visible so that when we do get through this, as we will, as we all quite rightly are saying, that we're ready for action. And I think one of the, I talk a lot about the creative industries being the canary in the coal mine in any environment. You know, there's a whole piece that starts to develop and starts to come forward um, where the creative industries are usually first to market. They're usually first um, to get things right. The, the, the history, however, has told, has, recent history um, has told us that that's not always appreciated because there are always bigger people that come along or people that can bash out the way. This is the time, I think, for the creative industries to really rise to the occasion. So there's kind of three parts to that around not going dark. What are the stories and how do we then, when we get out the other side, prove that there's, there's the canary in the coal mine is worth doing and knowing and seeing? Mm. Yeah, I, mean, I think in the first part of that, you know, if, if you only go dark, as it were, hibernate, if you absolutely have to. So I'm not advocating, you know, we, we all shut down. There's certainly, you know, let's be honest, lots of businesses that have no market at the moment and they have to conserve costs and prepare for the, the future. And, you know, in all uh, reality, some of those businesses will have to start again uh, elsewhere. But... For many other businesses, there's probably a lot more opportunity out there 
or will be soon once sentiment improves and probably sooner than we think. Um, and, and, and you should be absolutely you know, hustling to take, it, take uh, your place against that opportunity. I mean, for example, pretty much every single business on earth every big medium-sized business that had any kind of advertising copy is now going to have to start again mm -hmm. because the world has changed. I mean, think of the travel industry, think of the, the restaurant industry, think of all of it. You know, all those adverts with people, you know, hugging and, you know, traveling and doing all these things. Well, if you can't do those things just now, what's your tone of voice to your customers? So there's a suddenly overnight a massive backlog of creative copy required to address that so that's one example of you know very unexpected opportunities I mean there's other obvious ones you know we're talking on zoom zoom's gone from 10 million users a day to 200 million users a day um, we can't all we're not all that type of business but you know all over the place these opportunities emerge I think our story should be that we were ready and awake enough to search for those opportunities you know, and not, uh, you know, not, not practice a different narrative, the story of failure, a story of, you know, it's mm -hmm. out of my hands. There's always, every position has resources, as I said earlier, including the market. So, you know, that, that's, that's probably the best advice I could give there is once you've done your grieving for the situation is get active around imagining what that future's world is. I mean, the, the way you get, I think the reason creatives get to market first or get to, to first is that they, but creative people uh, in a professional capacity, their job is to imagine the future. It's, you know, mm. what's needed next? How are we going to represent next? And, you know, now the story to be written now is what do you think that future is going to be like? And therefore, what opportunities exist within it? Now, you know, something that struck me. Uh, very profoundly at some point during my career. After many years of working, I realized that most people, including myself, most of the time aren't thinking at all. We're just acting, we're just reacting, we're just doing stuff. You know, we get into that thing of a busy day, lots of emails come in and I went to lots of meetings, but my cognitive state was, was alpha waves. You know, I wasn't really thinking. So, you know, the, the best thing we can start to do in our businesses and our you know, whatever our capacity is, is I put in the mental effort to imagine that future and what opportunities exist in it. Most people are not doing that just now. You know, there's a very interesting thing um, I read about uh, in, in concentration camps, there was a psychiatrist that was an inmate in the concentration camp uh, during the Nazi regime. And his, his, his psychiatric training made him able to form observations about his fellow inmates. And what he saw was that the inmates that, that died, just suddenly start to wane away and die, were those that stopped thinking about the future and just started reliving the past. You could, you could almost tell when someone was going to start to die um, in that horrible you know, set of conditions they were living in because they'd start thinking only of what used to be. Mm. And uh, those that somehow who knows how, but kept a vision of their future. When this is over, we will. They, they lived more often than not. Very hard thing to do in those extreme conditions. Now, I don't, not for one second, trying to compare the two, but I think that essence of humanity we bring forward to now and say, you know, living isn't just about literally living and dying. It's about how you fulfill each day. And those of us that can start to think about that future and put that effort in are living. Those of us that are lamenting the past that's now gone are not. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, Rachel, but that's, that's the yeah. story I'd like to think about. No, Brian, um, can I ask a question from the, the audience, the floor? So we've got a brilliant question that's been voted up. Um, that's, do you think that as a result of now we're working remotely for a prolonged period, that this will fundamentally change the operational approach for most businesses? And do you think that the reduction in pollution and the positive impact this is having on the environment and present will also drive change across all the businesses in terms of environmental responsibility? 
That's a very good question. I can see why it's, it's mm -hmm. been upvoted. So on the, on the first part of that question is, I think it, the, the remote working will change business, but just a bit, like not profoundly. But you know, here's an interesting anecdote. I, I work with a lot of businesses and, and in one of those businesses, I was observing, a, a, I guess, a, a, a debate between the executives where some of them wanted to introduce um, home working and flexible working because and I happen to be a great believer in, in that because it means that everybody, no matter their stage in life, has got a greater chance of participating in a business and everything that they'll, they'll bring. But the, the other half of the executive team were suspicious of home working. People are going to, you know, take the piss, excuse the phrase, they're, they're going to exploit that and how do we know they're working hard enough and, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm sure we've all heard those arguments rehearsed several times. Now then, along came coronavirus and the whole company was forced to work from home as, as we all, of course, are doing, or most of us are. And within a week, they found that their productivity had dramatically increased. Um, now, there was a real disorientation, you know, they assumed that best practice was everyone's in the office together, but they found that their engineering productivity doubled, for example, in terms of software being released. And that's, that put that company into a bit of a spin, you know, what was it we were doing wrong before? Now, I suspect that company will never view home working the same way again. And I think that story is probably happening all over the place, even though we're, you know, we're, many of us are trying to homeschool at the same time and, you know, the, our homes aren't ideal for home working and you know there's a lot of challenges for it. I think the other thing that happens, you know, if I may borrow a war analogy again, in wartime certain technologies move or develop very, very, very quickly. Um, you know, there was like 25 variants of the Spitfire in World War II over five years. Uh, you know, that's an extraordinary rate of development. Yeah. Um, and I think we're going to see, depending how long this lasts, an extraordinary rate of improvement in home working tools. Um, so I think after this, there will be a, a, you know, a change, a, a, a shift. So the, the distribution will shift to the right. So more people are working from home and it's less of a taboo and more people are confident mm -hmm. uh, about, about doing it. So I think that will happen. Could you remind me the second part of the question? Sure. Do you think that the reduction in pollution and the positive impact this is having on the environment at present will also drive change across all businesses in terms of environmental responsibility? I think some, of the, some people quite rightly said that we're living in an environmental war We've now, we're now, you know, COVID-19 has brought our own existence starkly into reality, but we had a planet that was in the same situation, or is still in the same situation. So there's, there's a kind of a perfect storm emerging that maybe has made us more aware. Yeah, I, I, I think the short answer is I think, yes, it will significantly change how we view things, provided human lethargy doesn't creep back in. I'll, I'll tell you the thing I think it most changes. Um, humans are very poor in the face of exponentials. Because the thing about an exponential is, you know, if you imagine the graph shape, you can see my hand, for the, the first half of the exponential, even though the, the unit you're measuring is doubling or growing exponentially, the absolute rise is, is, is very small. It looks like a flat line. And then you hit the heel of that graph and suddenly that doubling starts to take over. Now, we have been living in an exponential for years now. It's called global warming or climate change. And uh, because we're in the flat part of that exponential, it's very difficult to get anyone very concerned about it. Let's be honest, you know, we're, we're, we don't really massively change our behaviours uh, as, a, as, a, as a species, even though it, it augurs our, our total destruction and that of our, all the life in this planet or the current life in this planet. But we act as if that's never coming because we're not good at exponentials because we believe, we think linearly tomorrow will be a lot like today, just a little bit different and the day after a little bit different from tomorrow. But what we've found in this COVID crisis is we're now in the right-hand side of that exponential for COVID. You know, we went from, I mean, we all remember, uh, I remember talking to businesses in January saying, you realize within a month or six weeks, everyone needs to work from home, get ready for that. And people would look at me as if I was mad. And why would we need to do that? This is, a, this is a virus that's contained in China. It's not going to affect us and blah, 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 blah. And then, of course, all of a sudden, it just overtook us. And every day, we're bewildered by 
you know, the stats and the events and the anecdotes. So I think we're going to learn from this what it really means to face an exponential because one day soon we will be in an exponential in climate change and we, we won't be able to stop it. The difference between climate change and coronavirus is that this will eventually pass to a new normal, but climate change won't. We can't fix it once it gets to the right-hand side, that exponential. So my hope is that as a, as a species, as a nation, as, a, as people, we reflect on coronavirus in the context of global warming, warming and say, that's what exponentials do. We've got to change our behavior. I think the other positive thing is we've seen that it is actually possible to completely change the climate dynamics on this planet very, very quickly. We need to fly less, we need to you know, drive less, we need to you know, use less fossil fuels. So the way we've done it is to stop the economy and clearly that's not the answer. But it does show, for example, a wholesale embracement of green, green uh, power technologies would make a massive difference and it would very quickly affect the planet. So we've seen that it's possible, we just need to find a way now. So I do think it will, my fear is, that as humans, we get distracted by the same old nonsense, you know, by Love Island, by who said what to who on Twitter. And, and I think if we take anything from this, this greater togetherness that we're starting to see, I and mean, it was wonderful to see, you know, almost a million people volunteer to help others during this COVID crisis. Um, it, I hope that that togetherness makes us able to focus and reflect together on the power of exponentials and our ability to take action now. Yep, I, yep, yep. I think we're all just pausing for thought there. I, I just wish and hope and agree that the this changes behaviour in all the right ways and in all the good ways. Um, another, Andrew, have you got a question? Any from Any from the floor? Anyone yeah, so I'll pick up the the next one. So Douglas Dowie has said, I remember in Skyscanner, <laughs> Mark, that you draw inspiration from stories like the works of Homer. Are you doing this now? And if so, what are you drawing on? And, and to clarify that, Douglas, that wasn't Homer Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> I was starting to think there. <laughs> I mean, equally, that would have been good, though. And that's where I draw my inspiration from, <laughs> Homer Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> He does have a he does have a lot of uh, wisdom to share. Homer Simpson. That's the great thing about the the Simpsons. It doesn't turn and borrow its wisdom from from all the place. And um, so for now, I don't, I don't think there's any one uh, source that would come to mind to answer Douglas's question. But what I would say is, in practically all art, there is uh, there's wisdom to be reflected on that we can transfer. You know, I've, I've personally, I'm sure many others in the call would agree with this, I've personally found it a very powerful thing to be able to um, transfer and analogize from one discipline to another. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I found that most insights I've had on my own condition have been transferred from something else, usually something artistic. Um, now, recently, to direct I answer Douglas' question, one of my hobbies after Skyscanner was to learn Chinese, which has been a, a, an, a, an amusing and very, actually very enjoyable, uh, sometimes painful journey. And recently I've, I've got to the level where I can now start to study some Chinese poetry. And, uh, you know, there's some, some real wisdoms in Chinese poetry from 2000 years ago um, that are very, you know, very uh, germane to the situation where we find ourselves in just now. So that's my current source uh, of, uh, reflection I'm not, I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to quote any of them for you oh, you've got to you've got to know that <laughs> <laughs> i might send that around later to the group but the my point is that pretty much anything you're reading just now and, and i would strongly recommend that you try to mix into your life just now some literature something some poetry uh, anything like that you will find meaning in it and I, I go back to what i said earlier this is a time than more than usual we need to find meaning and we've got, we'll find it all around us if we look for it. So you'll have your sources out of mine, but um, please look for it. And if you're feeling lost at the moment, the best thing you can probably do is take that old poetry book off the shelf that you never look at and just open it and read a poem. The chances are the poet spent years writing that poem before he or she committed it to paper. 
and there'll be a lot of wisdom in there that you'll probably get something from in these difficult times. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, I'm conscious of time. That's six o'clock, and I'm sure, um, Mark, you'll have some sort of uh, meal to, to, to want to get to at some point, um, as will the rest of the people on the call. Um, Keenan, do you want to maybe just pull out one last question, and we can use that as our uh, last and final question for Mark? Yeah, sure. Yep. Um, there's actually just a couple more that have, that have jumped in here. Hold on one second. Um, so, well, maybe this is kind of a good one. Um, so this one says, uh, for low, for low skilled workers, what can be done to enhance their employability during the crisis uh, like this? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, one observation I would make is that I think we are, if we didn't know already, we are going to have to reevaluate our sense of what jobs are important in this society and what aren't, because all the, you know, the phrase essential workers is a very good phrase. All the essential workers are what previously we'd have called low skilled workers. So I, I don't know what the reflections will be from that, but I sincerely hope it changes something in our society. The other thing I would say is to the extent that this, is, this doesn't apply to just to, you know, I hate the phrase low skilled workers, but to anybody is, you know, all of us should always be learning mm -hmm. a new skill, whatever it might be. And that creates options in, in our lives. Do you remember the famous Steve Jobs story where he, you know, he learned, um, he did a, a class in calligraphy, didn't know why he was doing it at the time, just was interested. But you know, 10, 15 years later, it, it was why the Mac had the best fonts uh, in computers at that time. And he was able to, looking back, join the dots and say, mm -hmm. you know, my interest in computers and my interest in calligraphy combined to give us the, the, the Apple Mac. Um, I think that applies to all of us in our lives. You know, we, we can't make forward plans. We don't, five-year plans are very brittle things, any kind of plan is very brittle because events usurp those plans as we are experiencing right now. I think all we can really do in life is create options for ourselves and options come from learning new things. Hmm. And you know, we live in an age where for free, it's amazing what you can learn on the internet. And uh, I, you know, I just think all of us, and this is an opportunity perhaps to do it, but all of us low skill workers or others, should be trying to learn new things during this time because it will create new options. And looking back, we're going to join the dots and say, because of that, I now do this. Mm -hmm. There's a brilliant quote um, by Eric Hoffer, um, the philosopher, who says that in a world of change, the learners shall inherit the earth, while the learned shall find themselves perfectly suited for a world that no longer exists. I keep that at the side of my desk yeah. all the time. Yeah, sure. I read a book review recently and it was talking about that the book reviewer was reviewing an author's book whose ideas about society were very firmly outdated. And the book reviewer said the author is one of the greatest minds of the 13th century. And I thought that was a, <laughs> a good line. <laughs> oh, well, fantastic. So, well, Thanks so much, Mark. Um, I think, you know, for everyone, thanks for, for coming on to this session. I think there's a lot of themes that have come out of Mark's chat for me. And I think, um, you know, what, what I took out of it a, a lot is that, you know, if we understand we're in the grief process, we understand there's an end to the grief process. So, you know, so like Mark says, I think try and understand where you are right now. Um, if you're at that stage where you need help and support, ask for it and look for people. And, you know, I think that's the great thing that, you know, that I found in the business community and is that people want to help you but you need you need to let people know that you can be helped um, I, I think that that mindset approach um, I remember the first sort of week for me uh, about you know a few, couple of weeks ago I was kind of in that panic and fear stage and I was just, you know I actually found myself crying at dinner one night uh, you know um, during it all and you know that's all as I say perfectly normal but you know I, I during it you know setting up a support group working with Rachel and, and, and helping a wider cause made me find purpose and so if you can do that right now now, um, you know, I think you've, if you can be part of the solution for those around you, 
is very important. I also stopped watching the news. Uh, you know, I found myself, I was watching that daily briefing and I found myself in a panic stage again. And then, you know, and for the last week, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not being naive that I don't listen to the news, but I'm choosing now to, un to, to sort of um, what I sort of focus on. And I'm, I'm focusing on my mindset on productivity and how I'm getting out of this and how I'm getting my team out of this and how I'm moving forward. I also liked Mark's point around kind of you know, sort of, you know, in, in that planning stage, there's a really nice tool um, that I'm just going to paste, if I can just grab this two seconds, into um, the comments. And it's a site called Wait But Why, right? And it's got, uh, it's got a, a, your life planner, right? And um, it's a really nice exercise. Um, and it basically just has 56 little boxes um, along in a line. And then it has those boxes repeated 90 times down a page. And it's essentially your life as, as a grid, right? And when you look at that grid, you can use this tool in many ways. You can use it to future plan. You can lose it, use it to look back at your childhood or different things that have gone in your life. And you can kind of mark off, oh, those are the months I did this. This is when I started my job or my business or left school or my first girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever that may be. But when you look at that chart, and, and if you click it, it's in the comments just now, um, and you pop that open, you'll see there's a lot of boxes still sitting there. And this box that we are currently in, this two or three weeks is a very small proportion. So I think when you can realize that, that, that this will pass, we, we get, need to get through it and we need to work through it, but keeping a positive mindset and getting past the, the now and trying to work out what those boxes are going to look like for you. And, and Mark's point of, you know, when you look back in five years, are you going to be proud of the previous version of you, the version of you that's just now? Are you going to be proud of those actions? If you have, you know, leadership in you, is this the time you can stand up and start to, to, to make that change? Can you help others around you? And I think there, there, there are a lot of really nice themes that came through um, from Mark today. So Mark, I, you know, you've left, uh, I'm going to be left inspired for this evening. So my mind's going to go off positively uh, after your chat tonight. I've always found myself inspired by your chats. And I'd just like to reiterate again to anyone, if you've not seen Mark's TED Talk, go and look at that. It's also in the comments or you can just search for it on YouTube. We're going to be running one of these sessions every Tuesday for uh for for, for as, as as long as as, as we will do it and um we'll do them um so we're going to be bringing on guests every tuesday at five o'clock it'll be the same format um if you if you know of people if you um if you have anyone that you think would be a great guest on here that you would like to hear from like please reach out to me reach out to rachel or keenan um on linkedin and drop us a message for that um but thanks again from me i've really enjoyed the session i'm going off to eat a salad that my wife has just brought to me that she, you might have saw just on the screen here so uh, remember to to keep eating and hydrating just now as well uh, and i'll leave rachel to give you some final words Thanks, Andrew. And thank you so much, Mark. It's always a joy to spend some time with you. I remember um, we had a conversation um, not long ago, well, a long time ago now in, in the anchor line, um, which I hope to repeat, but this time probably with not me crying so much. So same as Andrew, I've uh, spent um, the last few weeks uh, at times grieving in a way that I didn't think was sensible or possible. Um, and I've now come to terms with the fact that actually um, this is this is the this is unprecedented times and to be surrounded by people like Andrew and yourself and others who are so positive and so focused on how we can all get through this together that it gives you real hope um, to be surrounded by as you say impactful people. So thank you so much. It's times like these where we need to keep inspiring each other and and be here for each other and, and most importantly be brave and be kind. So I hope everybody enjoys the evening um, I'm definitely definitely going to sit in the sunshine with a glass of wine read a book and reflect on all things because tomorrow is another day um, but enjoy your evening everybody please do join us again next Tuesday at five and thank you once again Mark it's been a joy thank you very See you soon. thank you thanks Mark thanks everybody bye 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 Is that us? I'll, I'll just end this. There we go.